We have had so many, uh, which is wonderful, but it does mean I'm so sorry that we're not going to get through them all. But we'll ask a range, and then I would encourage you to uh, maybe come and chat at the end, keep having these conversations, keep asking the questions, because uh, I think there is a, a lot to talk about. First question, is it playing God to muck around with our hormones with HRT if menopause is a natural part of how he made us, or is it just good sense using the gift of medicine? I don't know who, who that, would like to start, I guess. I can start, yes. Yeah, yeah. um, so I've been asked this before. Good question. Um, and I think you have to address your own conscience about what you think is the right thing to do. But medicine is given to us as a good gift of God. If you've got a chest infection, you t take some antibiotics to make you better. These are provided by God. Nothing we have comes outside of what God has allowed to be in our world. So... Um, my view would be it's there if your conscience is happy for you to use it. Um, and we've talked a lot about when and how and how long and all of that. Um, but I, I, I don't know of any Christian doctors who would say ethically there is a problem from using it. So I think it is from God. He's provided it for us. You don't have to use it. But I don't think there's a problem to use it if that's what you want. I don't know Great. if you've got I don't know if you want to, yeah, just to say. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with Rostin. It's, uh, you know, God, God gives us all good things. They're under his control. And it's down to our conscience to search our hearts, to think maybe about our motivations in, in taking the medicine, what we, uh, and, to, and just not use it as, a, uh, as something which is going to be cover everything because at this time of life, there are so many different reasons for, for the feelings that we have, the experiences we have. And HRT will deal with lots of things, but it doesn't deal with our hearts. So I think it's, Using it well and wisely is important. Great. If I am approaching perimenopause, what things can I do to prepare, e.g. track symptoms, pray? So I guess uh, maybe a slightly medical question, but a, a wider question than that. Perhaps Rosalind can I mean, start yeah, with I think you answered your own question, yes. Yeah. So on one of those websites, the Balance website, there is a menopause tracker. What I'd caution you against is getting obsessed by it. There are more important things, as we've talked about. It isn't everything. And I think you may find your friends around you, perhaps, who are not Christians, it becomes their whole thing. And it, it's what they're thinking about all the time, what they're talking about all the time, what they're blaming everything on, and that's not where we should be. So I think it is helpful to be thinking about it. Um, but if you're doing okay, maybe ignore it. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's being aware of it, but not making too big a thing of it. Um, I think that's what I'd say. Yeah, yeah, again, agree with Rosalind. Great. What vitamins are helpful in the lead up to menopause? Okay, so I think perhaps I wasn't quite as clear about some of this stuff as I might have been in my talk. So there's vitamins and then there's kind of menopause products that you can get over the counter. Vitamins, I mean, yeah, if you're having a good balanced diet that has a variety in it, you will get most of your vitamins. That said, there are some things that are helpful. So vitamin D, we're finding that most people are low on vitamin D and it can make you quite tired, particularly if there's no sun. <laughs> so some over-the-counter vitamin D is actually really quite helpful. Some people have vitamin D is so in their boots, they need the high concentration stuff on, on prescription from the doctor. But most people could do with a bit more vitamin D. That's one thing. Iron. So if you're having really heavy periods, you might be becoming anemic, you might be becoming iron deficient, you might need some more iron. Again, you can have higher dose stuff from us, but over-the-counter iron is quite helpful. Look, there's a, a whole variety of other things that are important, but if you're having a good balanced diet, you'll get most of those there. So there's a huge um, sort of production out there of all the things you ought to be taking. Don't wind yourself up too much. If you're having a good balanced diet, you should be fine. Be, be a bit careful about calcium. You need calcium in your diet for your, uh, for your bone health. Um, if you're on a plant-based diet only, again, there are things you might be missing. Vegan diets particularly, you'll be missing out on lots of stuff. So just be a bit careful of all of those things. So that's the vitamin side of things. What I was talking about before was things that are, um, that are manufactured and promoted as specific menopause treatment things. Now, we were talking about this. So in the medical world, they haven't gone through those vigorous trials. They haven't had the standardized look to see whether they're effective and therefore can be promoted, or whether they have side effects, whether they inter 
interact with other things. This is why most doctors would not be saying, yeah, go and get them. I would love to say to you, look, it might not do you any good, but it won't do you any harm. That's not quite true, because it does depend what else you're on. So although I think generally, if it helps you, it's probably all right. But I would be very cautious to say, definitely go and have them. They'll definitely help you. Now, I know Sarah has... Yeah, different experience. So tell yeah, us about. I, so I, I, when I started having hot flushes, I did just grin and bear it for quite a while, and then I thought well, I might just give a try one of these over-the-counter things. Try. Don't want to go to the GP straight away. And I, and I, you know, you walk into Boots or Holland and Barrett's, and you think, what a lot of snake oil. This <laughs> can't. Somebody's making a load of money out of this. But I did buy the most basic one that I could find. Really, un, you know, not wanting to spend much money. And was really astonishing. It did help. And I don't know whether it's a multivitamin plus the kind of isoflavin. Is it isoflavin? Yes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's not got. It's not one that had the kind of lots of really herbally stuff in it. Um, but in my experience, it did. It did make yeah. instant r- result with hot flushes. And um, and I do notice if I forget to take it for a few days. Um, they will, they will come, back. come back. So it doesn't reduce them entirely, but it, it did make a significant difference to them. But that's just my anecdotal experience. Mm-hmm. I'm just throwing out there. I'm, mm-hmm. not, I'm not touting. For Another me. really good resource would be your local pharmacist. So if you don't feel like you've got to the threshold where you want to talk to the GP, just go and talk to your pharmacist. They know what's in all of these things, and they will give you a really good chat about what you might want to consider. Mm-hmm. A question maybe for Sarah? Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Is there beauty to be found in this season of menopause? <laughs> That's a great question. And I, I do want to say sorry if I've made it all sound really, really dismal. I may have done that inadvertently because I think if we th- you think of menopause being the ending of your periods, then... There's a lot to be said for that. Mm. <laughs> There's an awful lot to be said for, uh, yeah, just the you know, coming out of that, being locked into a, a monthly cycle and suddenly having the, free, you know, the physical freedom that it comes with. And as I said, in my experience, just a really evening out of, of hormones. And absolutely, God has made everything beautiful. At times, there's always something good, isn't there? Um, and I think there's a, there is a lot of emphasis now uh, on the on the really really hard stuff, and as mm. Rosalind has said, a lot of people seem ob- obsessed by it. Mm. Uh, it seems to be, as I said, uh, my kind of workplace it is just a, the, the theme of the mm. of the day because I think it, people attribute everything to this mm. because it's in the media, because it is be- is part of a kind of political conversation about women's health and how that has been ignored. So there's all kinds of reasons why it's a focus, and it's often a very negative focus. But I think we can, you know, with lots that we can delight in and take and celebrate with just the, uh, the wisdom of just having been around quite a lot mm-hmm. gives us. And I think we, we need to really emphasize that and remember that. Uh, sorry, I'm going on a bit. No, okay. But I think there's a... There's, there can be a lack in, of confidence in women in their in their fifties and beyond in churches, and they look and they go, "All these young whippersnappers who've come up, and maybe they've, you know, they've come out of CUs and they've had all this training and they've got loads of energy, and oh gosh, I haven't got anything to say, and all I've just got is, well, I did this holiday club a few years ago, no kids came, and uh, and we get it, we can get a bit downcast with it and think we've not got anything to contribute, and younger women are are really hungry for the contributions of older women. We are a great, great resource for the church, aren't we, um, in terms of what we've experienced. So we need to keep, if we, if we think we've actually got nothing to give, then we'll stop, we'll stop seeking opportunities. Um, and so I think part of the beauty of menopause is just that the rich experiences the Lord's given us and equipped us uh, to serve and in service is, is joy. Great. Well, I was just going to add in, and it's that Titus thing of the older women and the younger women. And in my experience, you become the older woman before anybody's asked you if you want to be that older woman. <laughs> but, and, and like you say, you think you haven't got anything to offer, but just being there and people asking, you know, how was it like when this happened to you? Or, you know, it is that experience that you just get. So, yeah, there's lots, lots to be had and lots to mm. find joy in. 
Can you recommend any resources to help our husbands or loved ones with what is going on and how they can support us? There's a book that's just come out. <laughs> it's a very good book. It's an excellent book. <laughs> Pause. Oh, I, I'm not aware of anything directly written for men because there's nothing directly written for women about mm. the menopause apart from... Pause. In those websites I was given, there's, I can't remember which one it is, but there's one or two that actually do. This is for you to give to your male family members for them to, to think about it. So have a, I can't remember which one it is, but have a look through. There's some that are mm -hmm. dedicated for them. Just talking about men, can I say this? One of the questions I had in a previous talk was, is there a male menopause? The answer is, no, there's not. So their, their testosterone levels will drop, but they don't have that up and down, and then they're falling off the cliff edge thing. So, so don't listen to them if they say they're having a male post. They're not. <laughs> uh, joking aside, I think uh, Sarah's book, Pause, is it's such an easy, accessible read that I think if you put it in the hands of a pastor or a husband or a loved one and said please just give this a read. They're not going to find it hard work no. uh, to read it, and I think would be really helped as well. Yeah, so it's not too kind of gory. No, <laughs> no gore, no gore. Uh, another medical question about HRT. Can we start taking HRT before menopause, during perimenopause, um, for the benefits of estrogen, not to lose bone density, that kind of thing? So yes, absolutely. So, so like I say, anybody that's displaying any of these symptoms after the age of 45, even if they've got regular periods still, that is part of the conversation. So taking into account the woman herself and what she wants and all the rest of it, but definitely, um, yeah. Great. Do any of the perimenopausal, get that right, symptoms, um, so low libido, that kind of thing, continue after menopause has finished, or do all the symptoms stop once menopause is over? Um, so yes, yes and no, some, not some. So the um, urogenital ones that I talked about, the dryness and whatever, that definitely can go on, because uh, you've no longer got the oestrogen. Um, other things do sometimes seem to regulate. So, you know, you don't find women in their 70s having hot flushes on the whole. So those, those kind of things do tend to settle down. But, um, yeah, some things will carry on. And, and it, yeah, I don't know if other medics in the audience would agree with me. I think they do all just sort of settle down. Yeah. If HRT is working well for you, is there a reason to stop it ever? Um, if you do stop, will the menopause symptoms return? Yes, I did mention that. So, um, yes, because at some point your risks will be greater than your benefits. That said, I have p women in their 70s that refuse to give it up. Um, but, ev but me as the prescriber is always saying, you do realise that as you get older, your risk of breast cancer is going to go up and you're adding to that by taking it, you know, it's, it's that kind of conversation. Um, but some of them were like, no, don't take this off me ever. And I have heard more senior people than me, more experienced people than me say, if it's about quality of life, why not? So it's that kind of conversation. But I also just say, if you stop it too quickly, or even if you stop it slowly, there can be rebound. And that can make it difficult for people to come off it. Because every time they try and come off it, their hot flush has come back, so they go back on it. And then a year later, they try it again. But, you know, it rebounds each time. So that can be difficult to come off. Yeah. We have had quite a few very specific questions about different uh, medical issues to do with the menopause, HRT. Unfortunately, we can't get through them all. Have you sort of got general advice if you, people have very specific questions? Yeah, I think I said it before. It, it's such an individual thing. You'll have heard me say that word quite a lot. Please do ask your doctor. That's what they're there for. Um, you know, book a conversation. What I often say is write down the questions that you have, because in that moment, you're here, there, and everywhere, and if your brain's doing anything like it might be in menopause, you're a bit all over the place. Write down the things that you specifically want to ask your doctor. Have that conversation um, and, and take it from there. It's, it's a bit hard to generalise. It's not a one-size-fits-all, so that's, that's what I'd say. Great. Uh, we're going to wrap up soon. There have been a few questions about maybe the negative sides of HRT, um, sort of different symptoms. We have one here where someone was uh, just 
taking HRT and then suddenly struggling to know where they were and just having quite a bad experience with HRT. Mm, mm. Um, have you come across those sorts of symptoms? And if symptoms are like that, is it worth persisting with HRT or is it better to um, avoid it? So it takes a while to sort of get level on it anyway. So in those first few months, you might be a bit all over the place and, and not sure what, what the um, good effects are, whether you've got side effects. There are different doses. So, you know, we'd start on one dose and then we'd do what's called titrate. So you might take it up or you might take it down. And there are different ways you can take progesterones. There are different kinds of progesterones. So there are changes that one can make. But not it, some people, it won't suit them. And actually, the side effect becomes worse than what you're trying to do. So it doesn't suit you. And you have to have a conversation about if there is other things. So it isn't one size fits all and it isn't suitable for everybody. Great. I'm so sorry if we haven't got to your question. I think, Rosalind, would you be happy to sort of stay around for a little bit I can at the stay end? For a bit. And just to reiterate, yeah, for sure. yeah, to go and actually get advice. I was, we were talking earlier and I said, I think sometimes we worry about going to our GP or worrying about getting advice because something doesn't feel as urgent, you know, as perhaps other issues. Uh, but yeah, it is worth getting that advice. Well, you start with putting everybody else before ourselves. We've been doing it, we're quite good at it. We've been doing it for so long. You know, the family always gets up their priorities, but sometimes you just need to think, actually, I do need to look after myself. And, and that's what your doctor is there for, to, to, to talk with you, so, yeah. I was inspired to write this book because a few years ago menopause hit me. When that was first happening there were a lot of books being published by celebrities. There were experts writing books about the menopause too and there was discussion in Parliament. Everybody seemed to be interested in the menopause. But Christians weren't talking about it. So it started me wondering, well what does the Bible say about the changes that women's bodies go through? How should we understand them? And is there any help that the gospel offers us? I hope that readers will put the book down after finishing it, excited about the opportunities that Jesus gives us in midlife and menopause, opportunities to serve and to change and to know him better.